Let's talk about surface mount soldering. So this is an Osh Park PCB that I had made. It's my Spy NeoPixel driver. All right, so this is a simplified design where it's just the 74HC123 timer and a quad NOR gate. Some people did suggest that the uh, gates could be removed completely with uh, diodes. I did try that. It doesn't give as clean of a signal. Besides, having a NOR gate here allows us to create a chip select option, which is really cool. So yeah, a lot of people think surface mount is magic, so I just thought I'd make a little video stuffing this board to show you that it's not that hard. Whoa, ho, ho, it's not magic, you know. Okay, so your surface mount parts are going to come in a tape and reel like this, so we just dump it out. There's a line on that side. That indicates where pin one is. Sometimes you might also see a little dot or depression like a standard through hole chip, but uh, typically you're going to see that line. So then you'll, if you notice the text is going from left to right from that line. So if there isn't a line, the orientation of the text will tell you where pin one is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the chip with my tweezers on both sides like that. I want to make sure the tip of my tweezers isn't going past the chip rather that it's flush with the chip. That way I know the chip is going down flat. All right, so I'm gonna take my iron, gray a little side here. I'm gonna put it on pin one, just a little bit. You don't need much. So I'm gonna take the chip, grab it with my tweezers, make sure I don't block the camera, and I'm, go I'm going to look straight down on it from above. Make sure all the pins are lined up. And once they are, I will heat up that one pad that I added solder to. All right, and if you only, uh, you know, hit the one pad that allows you to still move the chip a little bit. Right there, I'm holding the chip down while I remove my tweezers, so the act of removing my tweezers doesn't move the chip. Okay, now let's hit the opposite corner. Now the chip won't move at all. So the big concern, I think, with surface mount soldering is the idea that you have to solder accurately. You know, you have to hit every pin and you can't miss, right? And, you know, on this SOIC stuff, and on this larger stuff, that's totally possible. See, I kind of heat up the pad and the pin, then I bring the solder in. Oh, see, I kind of missed it there. Oh no! It's a solder blob. Not a big deal. So you can just take the edge of your iron and pull it away like that. Hit it with the sponge. Look at that. See? In fact, if you wanted to be super lazy, you just do this. Just blob it all on. Now again, since we've, you know, tacked down some pins, it's not a problem because it's not going to move. See, we didn't even need the solder whip to do that. But if we did, it would be like this. Let's add some. So this is a solder wick. It's basically woven copper. It's woven, which gives it more surface area, so it sucks up all of the copper. Just put the wick on, heat it up. Sucks up the solder. <clears throat> there can be a risk of sucking up too much solder and creating a cold solder joint. So just keep that in mind. Let's add the NOR gate. I'm using a NOR gate because a NOR gate is a universal gate. You can basically make anything else out of a NOR gate. Uh, same thing with a NAND gate. So the NOR is combining the two signals off the two timers and it's also being used to decode a chip select. I mean, it's pretty simple. The uh, chip select in SPY is active low. Now we're going to do the other side. Yeah. So yeah, same thing. Let's just, uh, let's flood it. Because that's easier for people to do. See? As long as it all flows, you should be okay. Then you just kind of work the solder ball down like that. Get it to the end. 
clean off your tip, pull it out, and if it won't come out, that's when you use your solder wick. Yep, as soon as you see solder start to flow into the wick, you know you've got it. Now if you look there, that's a case where it may have removed a little bit too much, so I'm going to just reintroduce a bit more. Then something else you can do after you've cleaned it up is you can just go in from the side and just heat up the pads just to make sure you've got good flow. <clears throat> now this is um, a SOIC uh, surface mount. This is like some of the largest surface mount you'd ever come across. Most modern components are going to be smaller than this. So this is probably kind of at the limit of what you can actually individually solder as I'm doing right now. And of course the techniques of Removing the solder it does get a little stickier as you have smaller chips. So you can do that too. See, I can just give a little bit of reflow with the ball of solder on my iron. Pull it away and keep it nice and neat. Let's do some passives. I have a pair of one microfarad capacitors. So what I'm going to do, since I'm right-handed, I'm going to tin the right-handed pad. I'm going to take my left hand, grab the part, and bring it in make sure it's flat. Then I'm basically just going to slide it in to the heated pad. Boom! Look at that. Same thing over here. Take it, slide it in. It's good to keep a grip on the component when you're doing this, otherwise it might tombstone. Kind of like stand up on end from one of the pads. Yeah, that's pretty much all there is to it. Got some more on the back. These are the... Uh, this is the timing circuit, so it's a 200 picofarad capacitor and then a resistor for each one of the two timing circuits. Um, the example I did in the previous video used an NXP timer. This is a Texas Instrument timer. The uh, formula is a little different. So the label here of 9.1 and 4.1 is incorrect. It's actually going to be 1.75K and 3.5K or whatever's closest. I'm going to do capacitors first, then the resistors. Same thing. Make sure it's flat. Slide it in. Could also use a clamp or something to hold the circuit board. I have tools like that. Sometimes I just don't bother with them. Actually, you know what? I should show you this one. The stick vise. Yeah, here, check this out. See? Hold it in place. No problems. I mean, this is a pretty small board. And if a component isn't right where you want it, you can actually heat it up and move it around. See, like that? And it will move around. It's kind of like being reflowed in an oven. There. All right, I'll just repeat that with the resistors. It is a good idea to make sure you have a little bit of exposed copper pad on the other side. So you can make sure that your solder is flowing properly to it when you come back over. If the pad is completely covered by the component, it will probably still flow under there and stick, but you can't really see it, so you don't know for sure. That is one thing to think about. What I'll do a lot of the time is I'll just stick on whatever surface mount resistor I have. Like I might not have the right size surface mount resistor, so they might not fit as well, but I'll be like, oh, well, you know, whatever I have, I'll use. That's really all there is to it, you know, knowing how solder flows, knowing how your tool affects it, doesn't matter how messy it is along the way, as long as it ends up clean. Kind of like redoing your kitchen. Yahoo, it works! Let's take a look at a finer pitched example. This is a development board that I build for video game studios. Now a lot of modern parts don't even come in through hole anymore. You can only get them in surface mount which is why it's important not to be scared of surface mount. So this is a uh, TSOP 20, I think. So there's 20 pins. So it's finer pitch, but the same theories will apply. Now this is something where some liquid flux would come in handy. Still, you need the same thing. Just tin a pin. So I actually push it out with my iron right there. Just look at it straight down. Make sure it doesn't move. Remove that. Look at that, see? Always orient the piece for what it's 
best for your handedness right-handed left-handed whatever it might be now see how the chip moved a little bit there so what I'm going to do is I'm going to heat this and lightly push it like that and I'm going to push down on it so it doesn't move heat it up some more now these pins you know you're not going to solder individually that's okay we can just glob it on so I'm going to glob the four corners so it can't move at all now I'm just going to Look at that, see? That looks like a mess, right? But remember, it's not how messy it is, it's how it ends up. So I'm just gonna get as much as I can off to the side. And look at that, see? Down to, look, didn't even need the solder wick. I really need to replace my sponge. It looks, it looks bad. Okay, so that one is probably gonna need a little bit of solder wick. Come in with a wick. I always cut off the excess because as you heat it up, anything you have hanging over here will also sink heat. So the less wick you have, the faster it will sink heat. Look at that. Easy. Now what else can we try? How about this? That is a 1.8 volt voltage regulator. It's quite small. It looks like a SOT23 transistor. I mean, it is a SOT23 package. Same thing, I'm gonna pick one pad, heat it up, make sure that it's flat. Now obviously in production, this is all done by robots and reflow ovens and things like that. But you know, if you are, you know, service mount soldering by hand, these are some good tips. So those two pins I was able to do individually. These three, again, not even gonna bother, just gush it on. One thing you can do is maybe just give a little bit of a push down to make sure the pins are as flat as possible. Whatever's left, just hit it real quick. See, as soon as you see the uh, flux in the braid start to melt, that's when you pull it away. Otherwise, you're gonna take up too much of the juicy solder. Oh, look at this. This might be a bit tricky. One thing I'd like to do is always make sure I have a nice, obvious circle for the pin zero. So really, with surface mount, it's more about positioning than soldering. Like even in a reflow oven, these things have paste on them which hold them in place. Or barring that, even if they aren't placed perfectly, once the reflow starts, the surface tension of the solder will pull everything into position. It will center the parts over the pads. So yeah, that one's a little trickier, but the alignment looks good. Same thing, I'm gonna hit this side. Make sure I don't press on it because I don't want it to move. There we go. And once we know what's in place, we can glob it on and pull it off. Sometimes the best way to solder is to over solder, not solder. This can leave excess flux on your board, but you know you can always just clean that up. Uh, you can get flux cleaner, but honestly, you know, toothbrush and some rubbing alcohol will do the job just fine. This is the revised schematic for the Spy to NeoPixel adapter. The AND gates and OR gates are gone. They've been replaced with a quad NOR gate. Because a NOR gate is a universal gate. You can use it for all sorts of stuff. So here we're using the NOR and another NOR as an inverter to create an OR, so that's doing the same thing it was doing before. We have a spare gate, and then this gate over here, uh, we're tying the chip select into the NOR to create an inverter, and then tying that to the clear lines. So clear is active low, so if chip select is low, that gets turned into a high, which goes into clear, which enables these two chips. If these two chips are held in clear mode, then the pulses on the spy bus have no effect on them, thus nothing goes to the NeoPixels. Just a few changes to make in the code. We set up two pins to be our chip enable pins, 22 and 21. We set them high just to start and they'll be active low and we actually want to send data to it. All right, so we've got two different commands here and a counter. So yeah, let's take a look at one. Okay, this one is driving the 16 bank circle of LEDs. So we pull that low to say that we want to talk to that peripheral, do our business and then pull it high. And then the other command, we pull the other pin low, do our business, and then pull it high. 
So that NOR gate and the chip select function will basically isolate the devices from each other, allowing us to use as few pins as possible on a shared SPI bus. Okay, here's the system up and running. We have two of the converter boards hooked up. Now the clock and data lines are tied together on these boards, but they each have their own separate chip select. So the ESP32 is doing is it's chip selecting one of these boards, sending the data, then chip selecting the other one and sending the data. So we're driving two pairs of NeoPixels off the same spy bus. They're just taking turns. Now, another thing that's cool about this is you might think, you know, one chip select line per peripheral is kind of wasteful. But what you could do is like, let's say you had eight spy devices. You could use a three to eight encoder and basically just turn three bits of IO from the ESP32 into a one of eight selector and then select which of the eight you want. Or, well, you could go quite a bit further than that if you wanted. So obviously in reality, you wouldn't have two different buses of NeoPixels. I wired this up in parallel to show that this adapter allows you to select it on the SPI bus. So you could have the NeoPixels and an EEPROM and a uh, serial I.O. device all on the same SPI bus and then just take turns selecting which one you want to use. So there you have it. Two NeoPixel adapter PCBs hooked up to the same SPI bus to allow multiplexing of the signals.